beloved Sheikh, the esteemed scholar and jurist, Dr. Hatem Al Hajj. Uh, I hope Dr. Hatem can hear me. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa 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 alaikum, Sheikh. Questions, anything we need um, uh, to get answered, we go to our Sheikh and he's always uh, available and, and ready uh, at any time to help us. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him. And uh, Sheikh Hatim is from those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed uh, their time. Uh, sheikh Omar, I'm hearing myself on the headphone. So I, don't, I can't hear the Sheikh, I'm hearing myself. So I'm just going to take this off if that's okay. Because I'm hearing myself, I can't hear the Sheikh. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, as I was saying, our, our Sheikh Sheikh Hatim is uh, from those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, blessed, uh, put blessing in their time, mashallah. Sheikh Hatim is basically everywhere. Uh, anything you see that's academic, anything that is of high level of knowledge and quality in, in the West when it relates to Islamic sciences, particularly uh, fiqh and Islamic law, but also in uh, theology and philosophy and logic, um, you find uh, Sheikh Hatim's fingerprints on it, mashallah. Uh, and Sheikh Hatim, as I said, he's is one of the, you know, the, He's, he's, no need for any introduction, Yani. Everyone, mashallah, has, has benefited from him. But unless, in case you've been living uh, maybe on another, in another uh, country or something, or, or I don't know, somewhere where they don't get internet access, uh, just something for Sheikh, about Sheikh Hatim. Sheikh Hatim uh, has received his degrees in both uh, secular sciences and in Islamic sciences. So he has his PhD in comparative fiqh from Al Jinan University, but he's also an MD, he's a pediatrician. Uh, he also works as a doctor as well, <clears throat> and so uh, we, we benefit greatly from him, especially in Amja when it comes to uh, Nawaz and uh, new legal issues related to science and medicine. Uh, it's a great asset to have Sheikh Hatim there to be able to explain these things for us, to be able to give us the correct tasawwur, to give us the correct conceptualization of the issue so we can uh, uh, give the Islamic ruling for it. And the Sheikh is also the Dean of the College of Islamic Studies at Mishkan University. Um, and so he also has been developing, and I've been working with the Sheikh, I've been blessed to work with the Sheikh there. And he's been developing a great curriculum to produce uh, new students of, uh, students of knowledge, a new generation of students of knowledge here in the West who are well grounded in uh, the Islamic sciences, but also with relevant secular studies, whether it's in philosophy and logic and the like, to be able to deal with the challenges uh, Muslims are facing here in the West. And as I mentioned, he is, of course, a, a member of the permanent fatwa committee uh, for Amja. And uh, the Sheikh, inshallah, has chosen uh, a topic that only Sheikh Hatim can talk about. <laughs> it's a Sheikh Hatim topic. And uh, it's uh, uh, epistemic soundness. You know, subhanAllah, we're hearing a lot about, uh, you know, conspiracy theories. Uh, people are quoting facts all the time regarding uh, COVID and, and, and the pandemic. So where do we get our knowledge from and how do we know what is sound and what is not sound? Uh, inshallah, Sheikh Hatim will enlighten us on this topic. And also just uh, for our viewers, a parallel panel with uh, Sheikh Naveed also for the youth on Tawheed. So the youth, we ask them, inshallah, to uh, please go to room two on the website uh, where Sheikh Naveed, who just finished uh, in the main session his wonderful talk on mental health in Islam, he's now doing a talk on Tawheed and its manifestation through du'a uh, for the youth. So inshallah, alhamdulillah, we have two uh, simultaneous panels going on. So uh, please you know, pick from whatever you want. And if you have two screens at home, maybe play them both. And alhamdulillah, the, the khair of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is, is vast, alhamdulillah. So without uh, further ado, uh, Shaykh Atfadl, barakallah people. Allah barakallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa khairan for the kind introduction that I don't deserve. Uh, Bismillah, alhamdulillah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa 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 sallallahu alayhi wa uh, you know, conspiracy theories and, and things of that nature. I didn't tell him, uh, but I will actually touch a little upon the conspiracy theories, conspiracism particularly, and not conspiracy theory, um, be, you know, because of the word itself, conspiracy theory or conspiracy, um, no one is denying that there were conspiracies. No one is denying that conspiracy has been a uh, an integral integral part of human history and there were many of them uh, but there is a difference between uh, believing in the existence of conspiracies and conspiracism uh, where you uh, basically interpret all the phenomena around you um, uh, on, the, on the basis of conspiracy uh, regardless of how manifest the 
uh, causes uh, of these phenomena are and uh, straightforward um, and sufficient. You have like a, even if you have sufficient causes, uh, some people still uh, like to interpret everything as uh, basically uh, a conspiracy or um, a product of conspiracy. But, I, you know, I will not talk about just about this. And, you know, uh, I, I wanted to talk about epistemic soundness in general, like uh, uh, the epistemological theory in Islam, uh, because this is extremely important, you know, knowledge. Uh, how do you acquire knowledge? And I will not have time to talk about what ilm or knowledge uh, per se is. Uh, Sheikh Sadiq Hassan Khan uh, wrote extensively on this. In Abjad al Alum, and uh, yeah, you know, if someone wanted to review this, they, they, they can go back to it. But uh, but I wanted to talk about the sor sources of uh, knowledge, sources of knowledge, um, and how do we uh, verify uh, that uh, these are valid sources? Because that is extremely important. Uh, before we learn, we have to learn what are the suitable sources for different types of knowledge. Uh, because there is a knowledge of the seen and knowledge of the unseen. Uh, and not everything can be uh, answered by science. So science can answer certain questions. Um, and so, some people think that science has a monopoly on truth. It is, you know, I, I hope that most people uh, recognize how false that is, uh, because if science has a monopoly on truth, it is unable to tell us the, uh, to answer uh, the most important questions that people, uh, you know, and the most sort of crucial questions uh, for people. Uh, where did we come from? Um, are we, uh, you know, Mosayar uh, or Mukhayar, do we have choice or we are we don't have choice? Uh, basically, uh, the determinist uh, versus the uh, non-determinist theories uh, of of human action um, or free, free choice uh, theory. Uh, questions about ethics and what const what what is ethical and what's not ethical, and how do you figure that out? Um, you can't take a question like this to the lab uh, to figure it out. And it certainly will not be, you know, no matter how, how much you value science, you should understand that it is limited with respect to, to uh, these questions. So science does not have a monopoly on truth. It doesn't even have a monopoly on uh, facts, which some people like to think. Um, it can answer certain questions, and uh, the scientific method is the right method uh, and the, sort of the right uh, uh, methodology uh, when it comes to uh, acquiring the knowledge about uh, the universe, universal laws, the matter, uh, physics, chemistry, biology, and things of that nature. But certainly there are many questions that knowledge cannot uh, answer uh, that, I'm sorry, many questions that science cannot answer. So uh, we have science and then we have uh, faith and then when we have philosophy, these the, the, the three basically compete for uh, giving you the right answers to different things. Uh, yeah, around you. Uh, so uh, some people think that, uh, so, you know, whatever science can answer, well, you know, the sort of empirical sciences, uh, we leave this to science. And then the questions that science cannot answer, um, should these questions be answered by philosophy or faith or both? Uh, and uh, how do we uh, basically uh, approach, uh, you know, these the, the answers to, to those questions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Nahl tells us in two verses, uh, gives us in two verses the epistemological theory of Islam. And you probably may be 
uh, you know, thinking of these two verses. وَلِلَّهِ غَيْبُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا أَمْرُ السَّاعَةِ إِلَّا كَلَمْحِ الْبَصَرِ أَوْ هُوَ أَقْرَبُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ وَاللَّهُ أَخْرَجَكُمْ مِنْ بُطُونِ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ شَيْئًا وَجَعَلَ لَكُمْ السَّمْعَ وَالْأَبْصَارَ وَالْأَفْئِدَةَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ So these two verses, 77 and 78, I think, in Surah Al-Nahl, which was Surah number 16, if you want to go back to it, uh, they tell us about, you know, the epistemological theory in Islam. The first verse, وَلِلَّهِ غَيْبُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ And to Allah belongs the unseen, uh, or the knowledge of the unseen, of the heavens and the earth. Uh, in the heavens and the earth, غَيْبُ السَّمَوَاتِ The unseen in the heavens and the earth. وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا أَمْرُ السَّاعَةِ إِلَّا كَلَمْحِ بَصَرِ And the command of the hour is not except like a glance of an eye. Um, in Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. Awu akrab or nearer. In Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. Allah is over all things competent or capable. Uh, and then the next verse it says, "Wallahu akhrajakum min butuni ummahatikum la taalamuna shayya." And Allah had extracted you, had brought you out from the wombs of your mothers, la taalamuna shayya, knowing nothing. Wajala lakum al sama wal abasara wal afida. So now and nothing, and he uh, made for you, Jara Lakum made for you, a sama hearing, well, absara uh, sight, and well, afida intellect. Laallakum uh, tashkurun, that you uh, perhaps you, 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 you'll be uh, grateful. Uh, so that you may be grateful. Uh, so now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that there is knowledge that is uh, basically beyond your reach except if I disclose it to you. Uh, that is غَيْبِ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلِلَّهِ غَيْبُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا أَمْرُ السَّاعَةِ إِلَّا كَلَمْحِ الْبَصَرِ أَوْ أَقْرَبِ To Allah belongs the غَيْب, the unseen, and the heavens and the earth. Uh, this is knowledge that we have no access to uh, with our uh, intellects or our empirical findings um, or sense empirical senses. Uh, because if it is ghaibit, if it is unseen, it is beyond our uh, empirical senses uh, because it is ghaib. Uh, it is not part of the world of shahada, the seen. Uh, the known, the experienced world that we live in. Uh, therefore, it is, it's completely beyond us. Uh, that is why, uh, you know, since the time of Plato, people have been debating over different uh, theories uh, metaphys on metaphysics. Uh, they speculated about metaphysics. That is that which is beyond matter, that which is beyond uh, the, the universe, the material the universe that we live in. Uh, and then, you know, Kant, who is arguably one of the most important philosophers uh, in, the rec in recent times, uh, asked, uh, you know, he summoned all the metaphysicists, metaphysicists uh, and asked them, uh, an important question, is that even rational? You know, is rational theology even rational? Uh, because what are, the, what are the capacities of the intellect to examine the unseen? And how can the intellect examine the unseen? How can the intellect examine the unseen uh, without any uh, sort of data from the empirical senses? You know, this has to do to some extent with Kant's position uh, on the d debate between uh, rationalists, you know, people who believed the, in a priori knowledge, and empiricists, people who believed that the intellect is a blank slate, and then you fill it with empirical data, and you process the empirical data, and how, that is how you develop uh, knowledge. So between the rationalists, 
mainly in the continent, in Europe, uh, continental Europe, and the between and the empiricist, mainly in uh, you know uh, British empiricist, the British empiricist on the island. Uh, they, they have been debating over this issue for centuries, and then Kant, uh, you know, came and said that the, the, something very close to what Imam Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, uh, co quotes from Al Harith al Muhasabi and Imam Ahmad that the mind is a gariza, instinct, or kowa, potency. The mind is gariza, instinct, or kowa, potency. It is. It doesn't come prepackaged with knowledge, but it is an instinct, instinct or potency. Uh, does it have any a priori knowledge? You can't say that this is knowledge in the sense of information. But the law of non-contradiction, for instance, we all we sort of uh, we 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 all understand that this. We concur. We agree. Uh, on on the law of non-contradiction, like one thing cannot be moving and still uh, at the same time in the same respect, you know. So the mouse, it cannot be moving and still at the same time in the same respect. We all agree on this, or hopefully we do. Uh, and that is, you know, that is basically the mold. That is not information per se, but that's the mold. That's the potency. That's the instinct. Uh, so, if that is my, if that is the mind, and then uh, the mind collects data from the uh, our experience here in this universe, and then uh, with that potency uses this data to do what? To generalize from particulars, like when you see, like human beings, like every human being you see, uh, ever, like uh, has, you know, two eyes or speaks or something like this, and you generalize, and then uh, you apply this to, to all human beings. For instance, that's generalization. The mind does that. You infer from one thing to another. You make pias. You infer. Um, and uh, also you uh, apply predicative statements. Uh, so this house is old. Uh, that's a predicative statement. Uh, the, uh, you know, the predicate here is the uh, house, uh, is, is, the, uh, is old, and it is predic predicated of the house. So these are the, the functions of the mind. Now, when it comes to the unseen, particularly Allah, because nothing is like Him, uh, then what is the mind capable of? Uh, okay, well, uh, so we have, do we have any empirical data? Uh, no, we don't have any empirical data, but keep in mind that the Muslim scholars did not limit his to al hiss al zahir uh, the, which is basically senses to the external senses. The Muslim scholars also said that there is al hiss al batin which is the internal sense. Uh, don't you uh, feel fear, sadness, hunger, anger, all of these? Are these extant feelings? Do they have a, a reality? They do. Uh, do you smell them, taste them? You know, how do you, like, you can't see them, hear them, smell them, taste them, or touch them. But they exist. Yes, they do. And you also feel the presence of your soul. Do you smell it? You know, can you smell it, touch it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. No. And the Muslim scholars say that uh, the, the, we can also feel God. We can also recognize God through al-hiss al -Batin. Okay. So you don't have empirical data, but you have this internal sense inside you that can recognize God. But what can it recognize about God? Existence and perfection. That's it. Hiss al -Batin. 
what does the intellect can help you in the, what, 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 how can the intellect help you in this regard about God? You know, like, okay, generalization, no, because Laisika Mithrihishai, and it would be expected that the creator is unlike the creation. Okay, so you can generalize, infer, inferring from the world of the seen about the unseen or from the creation about the creator, no should not work this way because you can't infer, you know, because Laisika Mithrihisha is not like anything else. So you can't infer. Um, there is one type of sort of inference that, uh, you know, uh, you could apply. Uh, it's, 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 it's a little limited, but Imam Taymiyyah said, a for Shirai analogy, like every perfection that is devoid of imperfection that you ascribe to the creation, you can, you would uh, a for sure I ascribe to the creator because he's more deserving of every perfection uh, that he had given to his uh, creation because you know if he had given it to them, then he possesses it, and certainly in in a way that is uh, not. Like the creation whatsoever, because again, nothing is like him. But aside from this, the intellect can't help you with much. The intellect can help you recognize the existence, also like a hassel button and the perfection of God. And you know, it can ascribe certain perfections that are completely devoid of any flaws that you will find in his universe, because you could say. You look at this majesty, look at this beauty. So, you know, he's possessor of, you know, incomparable, incomparably greater beauty uh, because he created all that beauty and created all that majesty and magnificence and, you know, uh, precision, etc. cetera. So uh, then uh, we're, we're left with what here? We are left with uh, what, uh, you know, we said we have the uh, senses and we said the hisses zahir, the external senses will not help us at all. We have the internal sense will lead us to, to uh, believing in the existence and perfection of God, uh, but not more. We have the intellect and it will lead us to the belief in the existence and perfection of God, but not more. And then we have the truthful reports, uh, faith. Uh, we have re truth, truthful reports or faith. And that these are the three things that you'll find in Surah Al-Nakhl, in that verse, Allah extracted you from the wombs of your mothers, knowing nothing, and he made for you a sum hearing Lapsar, uh, eyesight, what of Ida, intellect. So, hearing would be what? Truthful reports. Eyesight would be what? Empirical senses. Of Ida, intellects would be what? Reason. Those are the three that we have that we would rely on to learn about different things. Truthful reports. We said most of the ghaib belongs to Allah. So our window into the ghaib is what? Not the empirical senses, not the intellect. Although, like I said, the internal sense can lead you to the existence and perfection of God. The intellect can lead you to the existence and perfection of God, but not beyond this. Cannot tell you more about God and his qualities and his names and his attributes and his actions and what he likes and what he dislikes and, and, and so on and so forth. Therefore, we're left with truthful reports. You know, truthful reports should not be doubted as a source of knowledge. And that's the difference between the believers and the non-believers. Truthful reports. If I tell you, and well, many people would frown at this, that truthful reports. What do you mean by truthful reports? But if I tell you that human beings have forever believed in the existence of China without ever seeing China, touching, smelling, etc. 
and before the internet and before everything, but human beings, you know, in Europe, in, in Africa, in all places, they knew China exists. How did they come to know that China exists without ever visiting China, without ever seeing, touching, hearing, smelling, tasting China? Truthful reports. Okay. But how do you believe those truth reports? How could they induce knowledge or ilm? Uh, well, concurrence in the case of China, concurrence in the case of China. Uh, too many people agreed on the presence of China and that their collusion is impossible. Collusion between all those people who came and said there is such a country that is far out in the east and it's called China and you know people have these habits and etc and so on that's concurrence okay now is that the only way that you can verify the truthfulness of a report no it's it should not be you know this concurrence you know is is a means of verification certainly of the truthfulness of the report but is there another way? Yes, it's called miracles. So, the, you know, if you were with Moses alayhi salam, when he split the Red Sea, and you saw him split the Red Sea, should you not believe in what he tells you about God? Uh, I think you should believe him more than you believe your own eyes. Uh, if you were with Jesus alayhi salam, and you saw him heal the leper and, you know, bring eyesight back to the blind, and, you know, even bring the dead back to life and so on. Would you believe what he tells you about God? Yes. And if you were with Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you saw a whole army drink from his hands, the water gushing out between his from the you know uh, between his fingers, uh, finger whips, here. So would you believe? Uh, would you believe him when he tells you about the Lord of the heavens and the earth? You should, you know. So then, truthful reports can be. We can verify the truthfulness of the reports either by miracles. Uh, that will prove to us that the person is actually truthful or concurrence of many people uh, without possibility of collusion. Okay, so that is, you know, in a nutshell, how the access that we have to the world of the unseen. But what about the world of the seen, you know, the shahada, alam shahada? Uh, that that we are in. How do we acquire knowledge about Alam um, al-Shahada? Okay, how much should we rely on truthful reports, the revelation, the scriptures? Well, certainly, whatever. Keep in mind, I want to tell you one thing, that it, it is important for us to understand the difference between the Qatari and the Dhani, because that is a concept that is completely important so that we don't conflate the two. Qatai is definitive in its transmission and in its implication. Definitive, you could have Qatai, you know, in, in one sense and Vani in one sense. But Qatai means definitive. So once if something is definitive in its transmission, definitive in its implication, then that is certain. And that is where you should have certainty. If it is definitive in its transmission, definitive in its implication. If it is not definitive, it's speculative in either one, uh, then it is not definitive. Uh, so when it comes to Alam al-Shahad, did the scriptures, did the revelation tell us so much about, you know, chemistry, biology, physics, uh, things of that nature? No, honestly not. The Prophet ﷺ himself has said in a hadith that is reported by several Sahaba, Rafa and Aisha and Anas and maybe others, those are the ones I remember now. Uh, that, you know more about the affairs of your dunya. Uh, 
and so this means what? Go research, investigate, discover, uh, study, uh, figure it out. This is an encouragement for you know uh, discovery, for research, and 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 so on. Uh, and he said, "In Allah, in man's Allah, da an Allah anzal Allah dawa an alim hum an alim hum wajahi lahum man jahila." Allah never brought down a disease except that He brought down the cure for it. Uh, whoever knows it knows it, and whoever doesn't doesn't. Which means go figure it out, go find out. Uh, which is something that we have uh, not, you know, been doing for a few centuries and been dependent on others to do for us, uh, which is really unbefitting of the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, but uh, but in, in in general, when it comes to when it comes to uh, the world of the seen and sciences and so on, the scientific method is the right method to discover uh, the world of the shahada. You know, to learn about physics and chemistry, and the scientific method. Uh, keep in mind that Francis Bacon. Uh, uh, you know, and, and Ro Roger Bacon and others, they have taken the scientific method from Muslim scholars. We don't have to be particularly like, uh, we, don't, we don't need to be arrogant about it. You know, uh, it is a sort of a, uh, we are uh, a ring in the chain. Uh, we benefited from China and India. We benefited from Greece. Uh, you know, Muslim civilization benefited from previous civilizations, but we're not merely transmitters. We contributed a great deal to the cause of science and to the cause of um, knowledge. Um, so we were good transmitters. That's a good thing also, because we, as a ring in the chain, you do want to be a good transmitter, but we were not simply or merely or only uh, transmitters. We were uh, also great contributors, and we could talk about this, you know, for a couple of days. I actually would recommend for you to buy uh, buy this book for your kids. I guess it's like if if you haven't read it, it's a nice book to read. It's called uh, Lost History. It's by National Geographic. Uh, so it's a good book to read, uh, but, but there are many others, like the, 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 there are certainly many others. Uh, so when it comes to the, the, the world of, the, you know, the scientific method is, 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 is important. Uh, how much do we rely on the intellect? We certainly rely on the intellect a lot. Uh, we rely on, uh, rational arguments, demonstrative proofs, Khitab al-Burhani, as Ibn Rushd calls it. Uh, we rely on it a lot. We rely on it uh, when we attempt to understand the, the, the revelation, uh, because, uh, you know, our hermeneutical system is uh, very uh, dependent on contextuality and intertextuality. So, you can't really understand uh, the revelation without your intellect. So a hermeneutical system that is so dependent on, you know, context and intertextuality and so on will not ever want you to turn it off. Uh, but when it comes to a, the intellect as an independent source of metaphysical knowledge or the knowledge of the unseen, so it has a very limited role, um, so we don't count on it that much. And we do not allow it, basically, to challenge uh, the truthful reports that we get in the Revelation, because it doesn't have that power. It doesn't have that authority uh, to challenge you know, the truthful reports that we get in the Revelation about the unseen. But at the same time, our understanding of these reports should be a humble understanding of them. 
uh, humble understanding. We have to understand that the language that uh, the that the uh, revelation used to uh, point out things that are completely beyond the human apprehension is the same language that was developed by developed by human beings to denote things within their empirical uh, experience. So why is that? Because how if the, if humanity is the audience then the language should be anthropocentric meaning it should cater to hum, human beings it should respect their categories of understanding it should res, you know be a, a language that they can relate to they can understand but since the, this language uh is being used to describe things that are completely beyond the human apprehension then we have this so so called a modal affirmation uh, of you know the things that are beyond our apprehension. Uh, we affirm them without uh, basically uh, seeking to discover their f ultimate ontological reality, their howness, their modality, etc. So uh, you know we have to figure out the scope first the sphere the realm uh, where we want to you know uh, uh, identify the proper way of acquiring knowledge if it is about the unseen then we will rely we will want our intellect all the time to help us it's a potency it's an instinct you want it with you you do want, not want to turn it off but when it comes to the, the to the world of the unseen, you will rely heavily on truthful reports, uh, revelation, scriptures. You know the the revelation that you have come to verify, come to recognize, uh, recognize it as uh, divine, uh, coming from God, uh, without uh, being corrupted or manipulated uh, by uh, human beings. Uh, and when it comes to the world around us, we rely on the I'm still here. OK, I got it. All right. Um, so I said that I'll talk a little bit about conspiracism. Uh, conspiracism, basically, uh, the problem with conspiracism uh, is that, you know, it is almost uh, magical thinking. Uh, you don't need to prove anything because these are things that are done secretively, privately, and then you develop these associations between cause and effect and you know you train yourself to have a very loose sense of causation because you show yourself insufficient causes to be efficient uh or any you know sort of like the things that you have a bit that you're speculating about to be the cause, the origin of this phenomenon or that phenomenon. Uh, and you will, you will continue to convince yourself of conspiracy after conspiracy after conspiracy until your very notion or you know conception of causation becomes very corrupted. Um, and it you know, causation here will not need any scientific proof. Uh, you are certainly not relying on truthful reports because truthful, how do you verify a, a report is in fact truthful, concurrence or miracle? You don't have a lot of people around you showing miracles uh, anymore. And uh, concurrence is a different story. If you have concurrence, uh, but concurrence, you have to make sure that this is that they are transmitting something that is empirical, uh, not not telling you about their thoughts, because many people can have misguided thoughts 
and they can concur on misguided thoughts or or shubha or something of that nature. So protect yourself, protect your intellect from being corrupted and try to polish your fitra, rehabilitate your fitra so often. You know, when the Prophet, when Sufyan ibn Abdullah said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, tell me something about Islam or, or in a nutshell, summarize Islam for me. Uh, tell me something about Islam about which I would not ask anyone other than you. And the Prophet Sallallahu said to him, قُلْ أَمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّ Say, I believe in Allah and then be a pride. That's it. That's Islam. Uh, but in order for you to make use of this advice of the Prophet ﷺ, which is sufficient, your fetra has to be uh, sound. So rehabilitating your fetra is by protecting the gates uh, and not, uh, you know, uh, absorbing you know, information or knowledge that is not really verifiable and that is not true. And so to protect your intellect and to protect the data that you will process with that intellect and to protect your heart by pure spiritual labor. Because the fitra can be corrupted by seven different things. You have al-gharad wal hawa. You have ulterior motives and Passion or bias or both. Bias is about which you're passionate. You have shabha wa dhan. You have misgivings and conjecture. You have al-ada wa taqlid wa mawruth You have habit. You have blind following. And you have inherited convictions. These attack your heart and your intellect. And when they attack your heart and your, your intellect, you can corrupt your fetra, and then, uh, you know, you will not be able uh, to have that sound uh, tool, device, uh, to learn, to, to discover the truth and to act on it because the fitra is not only limited to that part uh, you know which is which is the discovery and learning and knowing but it is also it has also to do with acting upon uh, the knowledge that you have acquired so in order for you to uh, fend off those seven flaws you need to protect the gates. You need to protect your heart. You need to protect your intellect. Two things you need to do. Uh, learn the right things, you know, so that you don't corrupt your intellect and spiritual labor so that you could revive your heart, strengthen your heart uh, so that it becomes uh, قَلْبًا أَجْرَدَ فِيهِ سِرَاجٌ يُزْهِرْ الْقُلُوبُ أَرْبَعَ قَلْبٌ أَجْرَدُ فِيهِ سِرَاجٌ يُزْهِرْ فَذَلِكَ قَلْبُ الْمُؤْمِنُ وَسِرَاجُهُ فِيهِ نُورُ So it becomes that heart that is transparent, like a shining lamp. Uh, it has a shining lamp inside. Uh, that's the heart of the believer. And the light inside that is the, is the faith of uh, the believer. So anyway, it is our responsibility that we protect, the, you know, that we stand guard uh, by the posts and protect our hearts and intellects and verify the information that we gather and not consume everything uh, indiscriminately and be very critical about what we consume and understand, you know, you know where... To, you know, where to go for information about the unseen and about shahada, alam al-shahada, uh, because each uh, realm or paradigm, uh, there is there are sources uh, that we should uh, seek for each one of them. And like I said, it's the revelation mainly 
for the world of the unseen, and it is scientific method uh, for the world uh, of Shahada. And they will never uh, conflict. And when they conflict, there is there has to be a problem. We have to go back and figure out where the problem is in our understanding of either one of them, but that would take like a lecture by itself. Uh, so I think I am to stop here. Thank you so much. Very enlightening. Alhamdulillah. Again, this is a topic like I mentioned, only a topic that Sheikh Hatim can, can do, mashallah. And uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to speak on these topics and, and benefit people on these subjects as well. And we hope to, that we can uh, you know, study with Sheikh Hatim these, these topics in the future, inshallah, so we can also benefit others with, with the same uh, information, inshallah. Uh, as uh, we had mentioned, we, this is our last lecture, but we have a panel coming up, uh, inshallah, at 9.15. And we feel, uh, just as a reminder for everyone, feel free to uh, go online and enter the chat session so you can ask uh, Sheikh Hatim your questions. It's a very important topic, a uh, very uh, uh, hot issue. Uh, SubhanAllah, uh, uh, even from the Muslim community, people, you know, calling what, what pandemic, plandemic, uh, people, you know, uh, not wearing masks, uh, not taking the means. Um, and they have a kind of idea i've even seen posts by students of knowledge or on on social media that are telling us that this go, wearing masks and taking the vaccine is a form of shirk uh, or minor shirk and um they they have their own uh, kind of idea of qadr so while this, the questions are coming in sheikh if you don't mind uh, if i if i can ask you is this a form of minor shirk and uh, does this go against the issue of uh, muslim belief of qadr and and uh, if so, why do people, why are people confused on this issue? Why do they think this is a form of shirk or goes against Islamic uh, creed to wear masks and, and, social, and uh, engage in social distancing? Well, Alhamdulillah, so why would they be shirk? Didn't the Prophet say, Allah, seek medicine, O oh, servants of Allah? Didn't the Prophet say, uh, whoever eats in the morning for breakfast, uh, like seven adwa dates, um, no witchcraft or like uh, sort of uh, other ve uh, vermins will uh, will uh, hurt him. Uh, so you know, uh, there is there is. And the Prophet ﷺ taught us about safety, so much about safety, uh, like awkusika, atfiu siraj, awkusika, like aghliqul abwab, all of these, like atfiu siraj, you turn turn off the lamp before you go to sleep because the the mouse can basically flip the lamp and cause fire. Uh, uh, like uh, tie the uh, water skin uh, uh, so that you these are all different uh, sort of safety precautions uh, so what is wrong with uh, you know taking precautions and making provisions uh, did into the Prophet don't we you know learn from the hijrah of the Prophet that we should plan well and take precautions, just like other people take precautions. Uh, and it is not about, you know, Muslim or not Muslim. Uh, so Abdullah ibn Uraiqat, he was not a Muslim. The guy who, you know, uh, basically uh, helped the Prophet Sallallahu and Abu Bakr uh, radiallahu anhu uh, escape from Quraysh during the Hijrah. Was he Muslim? No, he was not Muslim, but he was an expert. Uh, in knowing the roads and the back roads that could be taken uh, so that they could uh, sort of evade the, uh, those, the Quraysh. Uh, all of this is, is what? 
you know, taking precautions, making provisions, uh, dealing with the universe, uh, the, you know, the, the, the consistent universal laws. We do understand that the consistent universal laws are controlled by Allah, created by Allah. Uh, every moment they are uh, being created by Allah and controlled by Allah, but at the same time, he made them consistent so that we can figure them out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about the earth that he put you know provisions into it in four days, sawa and equally accessible for the seekers. So meaning that if you sow barley, you don't harvest wheat, you harvest barley whether you're Muslim or not Muslim, there are universal laws that are sort of, that treat everybody equally. If you discover those universal laws and you know how to deal with them, uh, that you procure the benefits of Imarat uh, al-Ard and al-Khilafat al-Ard, agency on earth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had entrusted his servants with. So I don't understand why would something like this be a form of shirk. Now, if you want to say that uh, certain people will have, you know, tamam tawakkul and they will not uh, basically seek medicine, we will not force them to seek medicine, but the, the you know, Certainly, some of the Sahaba did not seek medicine. However, the scholars also talk about these, uh, you know, instances and talk about, you know, Sahaba like Abu Bakr and Abu Darda and so on. And Imam Ahmad also has a statement about this, uh, about Tadawi and Tawakkul and so on. Uh, so the scholars, uh, you know, he posit here that there should be a difference between medicine during the time of the Sahaba, which was based mainly on conjecture, and medicine in our times. Like if you say to someone, for instance, if you say to like Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, you know, this insulin uh, is, is a safe and effective treatment of diabetes. If you don't take it, you, diabetes can kill you. Uh, can make you blind and can make you have kidney failure in this long, many months or and can and what eventually uh, kill you. People who have type 1 diabetes, they can be killed by the, their diabetes in a few weeks uh, if they don't take uh, insulin. Would it then be expected of the dean that's, you know, that teaches us la darar wa la dirar? as the Prophet ﷺ said, no harm or reciprocation of harm, to say that it is optional to take insulin or, you know, and you can just decide to die uh, and not take insulin, or you could decide to lose your limbs or to have multiple organ failure and to be incapable of fasting, for instance, of making hajj, for instance, because if you are bedridden, you probably can make and cannot make hajj. If you are a diabetic and you're not taking insulin, you'll probably not be able to uh, fast. So would it be expected that uh, that the Sahaba alayhim, had they had medicines like this, safe medica safe and effective medications for you know uh, harmful diseases, that they would have avoided them? Uh, it's not. I don't think so. This is the deen of la darar wa la dira, and this is the deen of tadawa wa ibadullah. I can't hear you, Sheikh Ahmed. Can you hear me now, Sheikhna? No, I'm like him. Okay, Zakhla Khesh, Sheikhna. And just as a remark to everyone, I have five screens I'm managing, the questions over here, the camera over here, the speaker over here, and the audio over here. So if I'm looking down or up, some people are asking me why am I looking down? It's because I'm managing the different uh, technologies around me. 
and forgive me, I'm not a professional moderator or anchor man or anything like that. This is my first time. So forgive me, Sheikh, for uh, learning on the, on the fly with you, with your lecture. Right, <laughs> Hope right. I'm not ruining it. Um, yes. Sheikh, now we have a question over here from uh, Umma Ali. She says, uh, Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah uh, khair for the lecture. I have a question on sharing messages on any social media without proof. I see lots of Muslims sharing information without validity. Would it not count as sinning also? Would it not count as supporting conspiracy theorists? Well, you know, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal kafa bin mari yithman an yuhaddisa bi kulli ma sama. It is enough um, sin or falsehood for a person to relate everything they hear. Uh, so you are responsible. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu in za'akum fasiqun binab'in fatabayyanu an tusibu qawman bijahala. Uh, but this ayah, uh, all you who believe when a fasiq comes, comes to you with news, verify them. Um, okay, let us say that they, they are not fasiq, uh, but it is still uh, enough falsehood or sin for a person to relate everything they hear because these things can have an impact on people and can misguide people and can cause harm to people. Um, so if you relate, uh, you know, information, for instance, about, you know, the harms of vaccines, you know how uh, polio, for instance, uh, many of us, many of my, my generation, we had uh, relatives who had polio as children and they were limping for the rest of their life, severe limp for the rest of their life. Do you guys remember this? People of my generation, do you remember some of your family members having polio, suffering from polio as children? Polio has been eradicated. Uh, where, where is polio? Uh, do you guys remember smallpox? I had members of my family who had, you know, uh, sort of uh, many uh, deformities uh, because of small uh, smallpox. Uh, do you remember the, where is smallpox anyway? So these are diseases that have been eradicated. And don't tell me it is just hygiene, because these things don't go away with hygiene uh, only. Uh, hygiene is not making, uh, you know, the other ones go away. You know, there are tons of diseases around us that are more expected to go away by improvement of hygiene than polio and smallpox, and they're still here. Uh, so when you share information about things of that nature and someone decides not to vaccinate their kid and their kid then contracts the disease and suffers great harm, from this are you to some extent responsible? Yes, because you did not verify the information. And at the end of the day, uh, how do you figure this out? Like if you're not a, an expert, how do you figure this out? You, uh, you could say that the, the, the sort of the prudent way of uh, figuring this out is the, to see where the majority of the experts are. And if you have 98, 99% of the experts pointing to one direction and you decide to listen to the 1%, well, I guess it's your fault. Uh, and so sometimes the 1% are not even uh, uh, experts, but let us say they are experts, uh, but they're still the 1%. Why are you following the 1% if you don't have the capacity and that is where we go back to the idea that not everyone is mujtahid in every field of knowledge or every science. Just like in Sharia, not everyone is mujtahid. Also in medicine, in engineering, not everyone is mujtahid. Try to build a like a skyscraper and see what happens. Uh, if you if you you know if you don't have the expertise or the skills. So, uh, before you click share, just remember this hadith. It is, not, it is enough falsehood or sin 
for a person to relate everything they hear. The Prophet is putting a responsibility on you here to verify before you relay. Jazakallah khair, Sheikhna. And uh, yes, there are people who actually in the in the chat box mentioning that they do know people who had you know polio, uh, friends of their fathers, and, and so on. Um, Sheikhna, some people may cite, uh, for example, that that, uh, that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that you know diseases uh, cannot be contagious, and some may even say that well, there even seems to be conflicting reports from the Prophet ﷺ in this regard. Are the reports in this regard uh, conflicting, and how can we you know interpret them in the correct way? Okay, so that is why you need, yeah, that is why we needed the Mujtahideen to tell us uh, that there is no conflict when the Prophet says, La adwa, uh, or says, La adwa wa la uh, There is no contagiousness and uh, no uh, bad omens or bird omens. Uh, what is he saying here? Uh, isn't he the one who uh, first established a quarantine. Why is he talking about quarantine? Uh, that uh, when when plague uh, befalls a certain land, don't go into it and or, and don't come out. That is basically the quarantine that we are applying today uh, in our times. That is exactly the same quarantine, same idea, uh, not not anything different. Why did the Prophet ﷺ say, run away from the leper, you like you run away from a lion? Why did the Prophet ﷺ say, you know, uh, uh, like a shepherd with uh, a herd of sick camels should not take them near the herd of healthy camels? Why is this? Uh, all of this, and, and, and he also said, La adwa wa la you have to reconcile. You can't just say that there is a conflict because the Prophet ﷺ would not conflict with himself. You know, if you're unable to reconcile, then you, uh, and we should certainly look for the scholars to reconcile for us. But you know, if you are don't, if you have not heard of of a good reconciliation, you have not researched enough. And the scholars say that the Prophet ﷺ wanted to say that contagiousness does not act by itself. It is not a final cause, although it is an efficient cause, but it is not the first or the final cause, because the first cause is God, the final cause is God, and then you have an efficient and a material cause. So if I knock like this, what is the material cause? The wood itself. If I knock on uh, fabric, it will not create that sound. My knocking is the efficient cause. The wood is the material cause. But the first cause is God, and the final cause is God. First, the final cause is basically whatever everything is working towards, the final end, tell us. Uh, and the first cause is the one who created all of this and the one who created my very action, the creation of the very actions. My very action was created by God. Therefore, therefore, can we, can we deny my very action? No, we can't deny my very action. But who created it? It is God. So it, the fact that he is the first cause does not mean that my knocking on the wood caused the, the same applies here. The microbes, the germs are powerless without, you know, uh, without God, because it is God's will that causes you to be affected by those microbes or germs. Uh, but they they still exist and they still cause disease as an efficient cause uh, uh, that is created and controlled by God. That that's the, the you know that's the belief of Ali Sunnah. We believe that causes exist, but we be, believe that they are not. They don't have inherent power independent of God. It is. You know, uh, God's continuous creation, 
that is happening in the universe and continuous control of the uh, universe. Uh, forgive me for going a little over with the questions, but yeah, it's a special opportunity to have you here. So I want to make sure we can uh, uh, capitalize on it, inshallah. Uh, Sheikhna, uh, subhanAllah, actually, we had uh, uh, in Amja, the Amja gave the fatwa about uh, social distancing in prayers in the rows and having gaps in the rows. And um, once that fatwa came out, some people on social media were actually taking pictures in their masjids of how they implemented that. Uh, and they posted it and people saw that and some even sheikhs from around the world saw that and students of knowledge and they they said this was very blameworthy and they said this was imitation of uh, other religions and they posted pictures about how other religions, I think in Buddhism and, and so on, they prayed in, with gaps in their rows and they said there's no evidence for this and, and so from a fiqh perspective, I know we were a lot in Aqidah just right now, but moving from a fiqh perspective, is there anything wrong with having gaps in the roads, especially during a pandemic? Well, certainly people have to understand that there is a difference between halal al tarar and halal al-ftiyar because, uh, you know, uh, uh, times where we have choice and times we uh, were compelled, or not compelled in the sense of the rura uh, shara'iya per se, but when there is a need. First of all, like, the gap between the rows, uh, who would be the most strict? And Sheikh Ahmad, like for those who don't know, has a PhD in fiqh and, and he is uh, the uh, Hanbali teacher at Mishka. Uh, and uh, certainly I refer to him sometimes for questions about the Hanbali mother. Uh, so you know that the Hanbali Madhab is the strictest in this regard because we're the only people who say that, uh, you know, Munfarid Khalfa Saf Salatu Batila or the person who prays behind the rose, his Salah is invalid. The three other Madhab don't invalid, invalidate it. And even in the Hanbali Madhab, the gaps that will cause a problem are, you know, if they people are praying left to the Imam and then there is a gap of more that fits more than three people uh, and they happen to be uh, praying next to the imam on his left side then that would invalidate their prayer but if they are behind then it doesn't so if the strictest madhab when it comes to filling in filling the gaps is has these concessions um, then then I don't know where people are coming up with these. Uh, like, you know, I understand that certainly in in, in halal al uh, in normal circumstances, in normal times, let us you know, you you will you either align your lines or Allah will separate mm -hmm. your hearts. And we understand that it is important that we you know, align our lines and line up and stand next to each other and foot to foot and soldier, shoulder to shoulder and all of that stuff. But these are not obligatory, let alone uh, would invalidate the prayer of the people. Uh, these are sunnas that we should respect and we should honor because they are sunnah. Uh, but when there is, you know, a need for social distancing and for separation because we have a disease that is uh, airborne that is transmitted through uh, small droplets and so it is airborne and it spreads around you like for like six feet around you why do we have to make our massage centers of transmission uh hot spots of transmission is that what we want to do to our massage uh, inshallah, we have our final session in three minutes at 9.15 uh, Pacific time. And so I will just uh, give Sheikh Hatim a few minutes uh, uh, for a break. Uh, he's been speaking, mashallah, nonstop for about an hour and 15 minutes now. Uh, so we'll just take a short break for a few minutes, allow our other speakers to join the panel. Uh, Sheikh feel free to uh, keep the camera on. Uh, for the next few minutes to make it easier instead of having to sign back in. It's up to you, of course. And uh, we'll uh, just give a few minutes for our mashayikh to sign on. 
And we'll have our final panel uh, speaking about how to keep our Iman high in every circumstance, especially these difficult times. Uh, please stay with us and we'll be back. Assalamu alaikum.